you are about to experience, Jackson Snyder presents. We will examine the life of our master, Yahshua, by discovering his ancestors, family, and friends, by reviewing rare ancient manuscripts, and speaking to those who know him best. From the Vero Essene Yahad, now experience, Jackson Snyder presents. Only six days, my friend, and it's all over. Yes, in six days it's over. This is a prophetic message for you from the Epistle of Barnabas, and your presenter today is Brother Jackson Snyder of the Vero Essene Yahad. And I am your host, General Shrunkov. We hope you enjoy the program and are thoroughly convinced that you must do something in the next six days. Okay, we're going to start with the Epistle of Barnabas, chapter 15. And I want to go over just a little bit and very briefly. There, there's a lot of material here to cover. But once again, in our earliest complete New Testament canon, which is called the Codex Sinaiticus, it's dated to 4th century conservatively, but the text probably goes back quite a bit farther than that, at least 100, 200 years maybe. Um, in the Codex Sinaiticus, we have a New Testament with 30 books. We've got Revelation, then we got the Shepherd of Hermas, then we have the Epistle of Barnabas and the Didache. And we've studied the Didache. Now we're in about the fourth session on the Epistle of Barnabas. This is important to mention this because th this shows us that Barnabas was in the canon in the early days and was taken out, of course, during the councils in the 4th century by the Roman Catholic Church for one reason or the other. And I imagine that the reason that they did this is because the whole end of the book, the last several chapters, just it quotes Torah passages. So I, I believe that uh, the authorities believed it was just too Jewish. And nowadays, if you look into a Christian or a Jewish commentary on the Epistle of Barnabas, they'll say right up front that they believe that Barnabas was written so as to distance the Nazarenes from the Jews. Whereas the Epistle itself, actually, you know, the whole thing is about Torah. Uh, if you look on Wikipedia, it'll tell you that Barnabas tells us not to keep the Sabbath. Barnabas tells us to forget the food laws. Barnabas tells us that uh, the Torah is done away with. But if you actually read the text, especially if you read my translation from the Greek, you will find that the book is just, just, just the opposite. And again, there's a historical marker or two in the book of uh, Epistle of Barnabas. That historical marker tells us when the book was written. And the, the marker is in chapter 16. And the marker is that Barnabas says that what, what the foreigner has torn down, the foreigner will rebuild. And throughout the book, what he, he is talking about there, he's referring to the temple in Jerusalem that was destroyed in 70 AD. And really the epistle of Barnabas is just telling Nazarenes how to live after the temple was gone. As you know, in the Nazarene faith, the uh, Essene faith, the temple wasn't that important because they didn't sacrifice animals, and some, by some accounts, they didn't even eat animals. So um, how do we live now that there's no Jewish establishment, that there's no temple, that there's no money system, that we have been completely conquered by a foreign power who has destroyed not only our capital city, but has also destroyed the very foundation of our faith in the temple in Jerusalem. All right, so there you go. Um, the 16th chapter deals with the eschaton. Eschaton uh, meaning last things. And the name of the study, of course, is it all ends in six days. I've had a lot of questions on Facebook and from people in person when they hear that, they're wondering what ends. Is the world going to end in six days? Like, is the world going to end next Thursday or, or something like that? Or what's going to end? What's going to happen? Well, Barnabas tells us exactly what's going to end in the uh, 15th chapter. Not only that, 
the Bible throughout, the prophets also tell us, especially, and the prophet Yahshua tells us what's going to end at the end of six days. So, going to the text now, Epistle of Barnabas 15. Moreover, he writes, it is written in the ten words about the Shabbat that Yahweh spoke to Moshe face to face on Mount Sinai. Set aside the Shabbat of Yahweh with clean hands and heart. It's written in the ten words, ten commandments he's speaking about, about the Shabbat that Yahweh spoke to Moshe face to face on Mount Sinai. Set aside the Shabbat of Yahweh with clean hands and heart. And in another place he says, if my sons will keep Shabbatot, I will place my mercy on them. He also speaks of the Shabbat at the beginning of creation. And Elohim made the works of his hands in six days and finished them all together by the seventh day in which he paused. Got the pause in, in Greek. He paused and he set it apart. Consider, children, what he says. He finished in six days. Yes? He tells us that in 6,000 years, Yahweh will, will make an end of all together. For a day is as a thousand years to him. And that's witnessed, of course, in the Psalms and I think in Second Peter. He witnesses personally to me, saying, Consider the day of Yahweh when a day will be as a thousand years. So, my children, in six days, that is, in 6,000 years, will all such be brought to an end. Well, he still hasn't said what will be brought to an end yet. He kind of keeps that a little secret. We go on to uh, verse 5. And he said, and he rested on the seventh day, that is, after his son comes, the era of lawless is to cease. And when he judges the unrighteous and changes the sun, moon, and stars, then he will rest well on the seventh day. Further, he says, you will consecrate it with clean hands and heart. Who then can set apart the day that Yahweh has devoted unless he is clean in his heart? In all such matters, we've been deceived. Look, at such a time, we will surely be able to consecrate it and rest well, especially since we ourselves have been justified and are receiving the promise. So when iniquity long, no longer exists and all things have been made new by Yahweh, we will certainly be able to set it all apart. We ourselves being set apart first. Further, Yahweh says to them, Your new moons and your Shabbatot I cannot stand. See now what he means. The present Shabbatot observed are not acceptable to me. Only that which I have fashioned will be acceptable. On my Shabbat, after setting all to rest, I will fashion the beginning of an eighth day. The beginning of another world. Even so, let us celebrate on the eighth day in which Yeshua appeared publicly out of death and ascended into the skies. So uh, what they did in those days, if you didn't already know, they kept the Sabbath, the seventh day. But like it says in the Acts, they met together to eat on the eighth day, having what was called then and still called today in the Gape meal. So the, the believers, the Nazarene Essenes, they actually had two days. One was a set-apart, consecrated Sabbath. And the first day of the week, or the eighth day, as Barnabas calls it, because eight is the, the number of new beginnings, was the day of fellowship. So they had the Holy Convocation on Shabbat, and they had on the eighth day their fellowship. All right, let us begin. Go back to Barnabas 15.4. Consider, children, what he says. He finished in six days. Yes, he tells us, and here's the big jump. In 6,000 years, Yahweh will make an end of all together. For a day is as a thousand years to him. He witnesses personally to me. Barnabas is speaking to him of himself, saying, Consider the day of Yahweh when a day will be as a thousand years. So, my children, in six days, that is, in six thousand years, will all such be brought to an end. Is he talking about six thousand years from the time he lived? I don't think so. I looked into a number of biblical chronologers in the last few months. In fact, I called one on the phone yesterday, a person that's got the Bible uh, timeline all mapped out. And Bible chronologers tell us generally that over 6,000 years have passed 
since the time of Adam and Eve. A Bishop Usher, perhaps you've heard of him, Usher's chronology, in the 16th century, he calculated through the um, genealogies in the Old Testament that the second creation, that is Genesis chapter 2, began in 4004 B.C., just about, uh, I would say, 75% of the Bible chronologers I looked at, and there are a lot of people that do this, are very close to that same count that Adam and Eve came to be in the second creation on 4004 B.C. That's 6,000 years ago. Now look, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, there are two creations, as you recall. There's a first creation that's bottom up, and the second creation in chapter 2 is top down. They're completely different. And any Jewish scholar would tell you, if you ask why, they would say there are two creations they're in characterized. The first creation, some people call it a pre-Adamic race. Where did Cain know his wife? Cain came from the second creation. And despite what the book of Jubilees says, Cain went out into the wilderness and found his wife because there were plenty of people out there. It's just that in Genesis chapter 2, Yahweh is giving a second creation in order to preserve the blood of Adam and Eve which came, as we learned when we did the animal apocalypse a couple of weeks ago, through Shem, the son of Noah, and on into our posterity. Yes, that same blood, the Shemite or Semite blood, is out there someplace. It's evident today with genealogical uh, reviews and genetic tests that a lot of people have some of that blood. Now, that's not Jewish blood, remember. That's Hebrew blood. That blood came along long before there was ever a Jewish person. And our understanding today is that 80 to 90 percent of the people who call themselves Jews have no Jewish blood at all, no, no relation to the patriarchs of the Bible. That's a common genetic fact now. So let's take a look at that six-day creation in Genesis chapter 1 so we can get a little insight into where we actually are in this. And I'm looking at Genesis 1, 16 through 19. And Elohim made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars also. This is just what Barnabas says in 15. And Elohim set them in the firmament of heaven, that is the sky, to give light upon the earth. Now, emphasize light in your mind, because we come back to that in a minute. And to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness, and Elohim saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fourth day. Okay, that's the fourth day. Now we're going to go to the fifth day in Genesis 1.20. And Elohim said... Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. That's the other watch word that we're looking for. Life. Keep it in mind. And let fowl fly above the earth in the open firmament of the sky. And Elohim created the great sea and monsters and every living creature that moveth which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kinds, and every winged fowl after its kind, and Elohim saw it was good. And Elohim blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. So on the fourth day, light. On the fifth day, life. Now, what happens here is that the Gospel of John tells us the date that Yahshua was born in an implicit, mysterious way in the prologue to his gospel, John chapter 1, 1 through 5, 12 and 13. This writer says, in the beginning was the Logos, the Word, and the Logos was with Elohim, and the Logos was Elohim. The same was in the beginning with Elohim. All things came to be through him, and without him was not anything coming to be that came to be. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. Here we have these words again. Light and life. John's trying to tell us something here. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness apprehended it not or comprehended it not, or mastered it not, or overcame it not. Nobody actually knows what that word means in there. But as many as received him, 
To them gave he the right to become children of Elohim, to them that believe on his name. Okay, here's light and life again. The receiving of him is the light. The right to become children of Elohim is the life. To them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of Elohim. Subtly, in this text, John is giving us a clue as to what year Yahshua was born. Now, if Barnabas is right, and the six days are indeed part of an ancient doctrine of the Nazarenes, then John is telling us that Yahshua came to be upon this earth between light and life. That is, on the juncture of the end of the fourth day and the beginning of the fifth day. And if we count that up from 4,000 or so B.C., the end of the fourth day and the beginning of the fifth day hits right around 1 B.C. In most of the reckoning, Yahshua was actually born in 4 B.C., but that is always a matter of argument. It's somewhere around there, that's for sure. They say 4 B.C. because Josephus speaks of a lunar eclipse when Herod died, King Herod the Great. And we read in Matthew concerning the slaughter of the innocents that King Herod caused that to happen, sent people to Bethlehem that killed all the children two and under. Now, King Herod had to be alive then when Yahshua was born. So they are conservatively saying because Josephus says Herod died in 4 BC because there was a, a lunar eclipse, then Yahshua had to be born in 4 BC or a couple years earlier. Well, uh, to tell you the truth, Usher in the 17th century with his chronology hits it right on the button as far as Yahshua coming at the juncture of light and life coming at the beginning of the 5,000th year day. All right, so that mystery is solved. 4,000 years before Messiah, four. This the fifth day goes from his birth to about 1,000 A.D., and the sixth day goes up to 2,000 A.D., and as you know, we all, do you know what year it is here, or are we in a coma? Yes, it's 2014, right? Okay, so... We're on the other side of the six days right now. Now they say that these characters of the New Testament thought Messiah was coming right away, that his parousia was imminent, that Paul was almost beside himself telling people that Joshua was going to come right away. But it seems like this is another train of thought. This is a more Nazarene train of thought. It's more scientific. Barnabas knows exactly where he is in time. He's somewhere 70 years into the fifth day. And he knows that six days have to be completed first before the end of lawlessness. He was not a dummy. And he gives us a clue. Even now, this text being found in the recent centuries tells us that the Nazarenes knew exactly what time they were living in and exactly what time that Yahshua would put an end to evil and lawlessness. So what of these fifth and sixth days? That is, the time from Yahshua's resurrection until today, or a couple of, uh, a dozen years ago. Okay, the last 2,000 years represent the years approximately 1 B.C. to 2,000 A.D. When the prophets speak of the latter days, they're speaking of this time period, of 2,000 years. Let me give you one example. You can find many, many more. For instance, Hosea 3, 4 through 5, speaking of these last days, the thousand years up to 1000 AD and the thousand to 2000, for the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king and without a prince and without sacrifice and without pillar and without ephod or teraphim. Afterward, Shall the children of Israel return and seek Yahweh their Elohim and Dawid their king and shall come with fear unto Yahweh to his goodness in the latter days? Hosea, who prophesied, what, 500 years before Messiah, is pointing to the 2,000 years after him. And we find now at the very end of the sixth day, that in the last 150 years, Israelites have been returning in these latter days. And at the end of the sixth day in 1948, 
we have a new nation of Israel. And in the seventh day, we'll have even a greater nation of Israel. I know a lot of people want to make Aliyah. They want to go to that little strip of land called Palestine today, uh, about the size of the Florida panhandle. But is that all there is? That's not all there is to the land. But the amazing thing here with the Hosea prophecy of the latter days and several other ones is that, yes, in this, the latter days, the fifth and sixth days, especially the end of the sixth day, we find all kinds of renewals happening. If it's about 6,014 now, why is it that the Jerusalem Post today says it's the 4th of Tishri, 5775? Shouldn't the Jewish calendar be right? Haven't they been counting since Adam? We're off with the Jewish calendar. Are we saying that the Roman calendar is more accurate? No, I think in this case so. It's 5775 in Jewry, and it's 6014 in the Hebraic calendar. So I went looking for why there was a discrepancy, and I found it. I tracked down a, an ancient text of the Jews, the text that keeps time for them. You've probably heard of the Seder Haolam. Seder Haolam. We have one here on our bookshelf. It is a chronology of Judaism from the beginning, Adam to the end, okay? Till, the, till whenever it was written, I don't know when. There's another one called the Seder Hadorot. It's a little harder to find, but I noticed there was a copy or two on Amazon. But the Seder Hadorot is another Jewish biblical chronology book that tells us that in 165 AD, you've heard of the Rabbi Akiva? Okay, he was the chief rabbi of the Jews in Jerusalem during the second Jewish revolt against Rome. There was a man raised up named Simon bar Kosiba, who was a military leader, a very rough, mean man. But he took it upon himself to rid Israel of the Romans as a second attempt. As you know, uh, 60 years before, in the first Jewish revolt, Rome flattened everything in Israel. Well, this was the second revolt. Simon bar Kosova had a real good little string of successes there, chasing the Romans out of Jerusalem. And he went good with his army of thugs for about a year. At that time, Rabbi Akiva, which was the chief rabbi, as I said, and his crew on hand there in Jerusalem, considered Simon bar Kosova the Messiah. And they told Jewry the whole world over that the Messiah had come. However, they had a little problem. In their reckoning of when the prince would come from Daniel, where is that, Daniel chapter 9? Daniel 11, can't remember. The prince would come, their year count was off. So they figured since Simon is the Messiah, and he's come in 165, then our calendar must be off. Because we're 240 years out of sync with the prophecy. In order to make the prophecy and our Messiah come at the uh, both at the same time, we've made a mistake somewhere of 240 years. So immediately they subtracted 240 years from that Jewish calendar. One day it was 165 A.D., the next day was 240 years earlier. So there's 240 years lost off the Jewish calendar. I wish the Jews would acknowledge this. Because if they put that 240 years back that Akiva took off in the 2nd century A.D., and they added it on to the year they have in the Jerusalem Post today, 5775, then we would miraculously get the year 6015. As you know, their secular year starts in the fall. It's just started. It's one year ahead of us. We have the year 6014. They're in the year 6015. That's amazing. You are listening to Jackson Snyder Presents on Hebrew Nation Radio. We'll be right back after these important announcements.
Jackson Snyder Presents is sponsored by Vero Asenia Hod, a biblical literature think tank headquartered in Vero Beach, Florida. Vero Yahad provides new translations, online seminars, rare books and research work connected with the Zadokite movement, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the New Testament. Free lectures, lecture recordings, and literature are posted at www.veroyahad.org. That's V-E-R-O-Y-A-H-A-D dot org. Contact me, your host, Jackson Snyder, by email at veroyahad at gmail.com or catch us all on Facebook. By adjusting one more time, our common calendar with the year that never was, that is, there is no year zero, we get the Jewish calendar and our common calendar on the exact same year from Adam, which we call the Hebrew year, 615 years since Adam. If Barnabas is right, and this early Nazarene doctrine is right, then we are even now 15 years into the millennium. I taught this before, and people said, well, you're nuts. It can't be the millennium. Jesus comes at the beginning of the millennium. Judgment comes at the beginning of the millennium. You're just plain wrong. And I had a guy on Facebook that just fought tooth and nail in a, in a thread today. He caught me calling me all kinds of names. I had to erase his posts because he even got into calling me the F word a few times. Because uh, I said, you don't even know what I'm teaching on. Why don't you join us and find out before you start criticizing? Okay, well, that was, I said that before he started calling me the F word. Anyway, it's controversial. Could we be in the millennium now at the very lip? Could we be in that seventh day that Barnabas talks about, which is a thousand years? And if we're in the millennium, why hasn't Yahshua come? We'll have to look at that. If you've got a Bible, you might want to turn over to Matthew 24, 42. We're going to look at four passages in the New Testament out of the many that specify what I want you to know. Matthew 24, 42. Now, some people think that Matthew 24 is Yahshua's prediction of the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Some say that it goes beyond that. It does predict the 70 A.D. debacle. But if you read past that, you'll see that Matthew's prophecy in particular goes beyond. All of a sudden, he jumps from the destruction of Jerusalem to the destruction of evil. And Yahshua says this in verse 42. Watch therefore, for you know, know not on what day your master comes. But know this... That if the master of the house had known in what watch the thief was coming, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken through. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in an hour that you think not the Son of Man cometh. I'm going to reiterate that from Luke chapter 12, 39. He uses the same likening, the same similitude, but in a little different way. But know this, he says, that if the master of the house had known in what hour the thief was coming, he would have watched and not have left his house to be broken through. Be also ready, for in an hour that ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Of course, Son of Man, he's uh, referring to himself. We studied the Son of Man over and over in the Enoch sessions. We know that the Son of Man is the intermediary between Elohim and humankind, the intermediary between humankind and the angels, and that the Son of Man in the book of Enoch is given the responsibility to judge. I'm going to skip over to Paul now, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 through 4. Not many people like Paul these days, but we can't do without him. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of Yahweh, that's the day of judgment, so cometh as a thief in the night. When they are saying peace and safety, then suddenly destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall in no wise escape. He's talking about the Katayim, the sinners. He's talking about the tyrants of the world. He's talking about the Gibberim and the Nephilim that are on earth now. None of them will escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness. 
that that day should overtake you as a thief. Thanks to Barnabas, we, we need not be in darkness. Are you setting dates? You're not allowed to set dates. Because Yahshua said something like that 2,000 years ago. Remember, he also said, can't you perceive the signs of the times? We're in the beginning of the seventh day. Let me take you one place else. 2 Peter 3.10, which you probably all know by heart. But the day of Yahweh, that is the judgment, will come as a thief, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall be dissolved with fervent heat, and the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. All right, doesn't make any difference how you interpret the burning up. Whether you see it as an atomic bomb or you see it symbolically. I certainly don't see it as an atomic bomb. Uh, Scripture tells us that the world never ends. But again, the similitude of the parable is used that the day of Yahweh comes as a thief. And who comes in Yahweh's stead but Yahshua? He speaks of himself as coming as a thief. This is a secret presence. This is an unseen coming. If we take a look at the rest of Matthew chapter 24... We see why this initial coming is secret. Because he's arranging the nations in order to bring forth that one world government that's not of the beast, not of an antichrist, not of a devil, but of Yahshua, the new King David himself. Let me just throw out a couple of other prophecies that aren't, aren't on the list here for you concerning that. If you go to Psalm chapter 2, the most prophetic of all the Psalms, Psalm 2, and you will read there, speaking of the sun, setting the nations up for a fall. Why do the nations rage and the world imagine vain things? You remember that Psalm. Read it over. Yahshua comes first to set up the nations. But second of all, you see, maybe this is later on in the notes. Yeah, I'm going to save this. I want to tell you where Israel is. Because it's not that little strip of land. When judgment comes upon the land of Israel, we need to know where that's going to be. So anyway, I I have, when I have brought this thief in the night thing up, on numerous occasions, somebody will point out to me, well, what about Matthew 24, 27? As the lightning cometh forth from the east, and is seen even unto the west, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. Doesn't that pertain to a public advent, a public parousia, where everybody in the world was seen like lightning or like fireworks going off or an amazing burst of stars in the sky, an amazing show? I want to give you a little something here that you may receive or may not. There is that word lightning in Matthew 24, 27. That word is estrape. Astrape. It has to do, astro, obviously has something to do with star. This word means also enlightening. And why I'm saying that is that if you use an old concordance like Strong's, or one of the many that are used today from the 19th or 18th century, half the words in there are mistranslated. Strong's Concordance is not good. You need something more modern and up-to-date because we have received many, many, many new ancient texts since 1860 or 1770 to help us understand what these words mean. If you see enlightening coming forth from the east, didn't Yahshua the star, which was an angel, come forth from the east to enlighten the world? It tells us that this is a matter of education and time, a gradual manifestation. The Son of Man, as per the definition in Enoch, that is, the intermediary between Elohim and Malachim and Adamim, will bring this enlightening forth through time and change. The world has to be set aright in some ways first before he can manifest his public presence. I'll just leave that as that is right now. We could go deep into that, but just think about it. All right, we'll go back to Barnabas now. Barnabas saying, So my children in six days, that is in 6,000 years, will all such be brought to an end. And he's not talking about uh, 2 Peter 3.10, that everything explodes and blows up. What to, will be brought to end in the six days or the beginning of the end 
we have to look at several other scriptures starting in Barnabas. Yes, I've got about ten more minutes and I'll be done. Barnabas 15.5. This he said, and he rested on the seventh day, that is, after his son comes, whether that be a purloined coming or a public coming, the era of the lawless is to cease. Lawless. Anomia. Or in Hebrew you'd understand that as Torahlessness. Lawlessness is to cease. The lawless are to cease. And in the next verse, 4, And when he judges the unrighteous and changes the sun, moon, and stars, then he will rest well on the seventh day. What does that mean? This may be the most important part here. In the seventh day, lawlessness is to cease, first of all. We're in the seventh day. But the end of the lawlessness is a process and described in the prophets. In the seventh day sometime, the unrighteous will be judged. Now you've got to understand judgment doesn't necessarily mean condemnation or damnation. This is another problem with these concordances from 200 years ago. Yahshua said in John 5, 29, talking about the dead, they shall come forth to life. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done ill unto the resurrection of judgment. The word there for judgment is crisis. We get the English word crisis. This is kind of a judgment is like in the Torah. You know when the Torah says a person needs to die for their sin, especially a mortal sin, the judge has the ability to lay down any penalty up and including the fullest extent of the Torah. You know that. Just because someone commits adultery doesn't mean they're going to die or a woman going to be stoned. The judge, it's in the hands of the judge. My fate is in the hands of the judge. Earlier on there in John 5, it says that the righteous will be among those of the first resurrection. We understand that is a spiritual bodily resurrection. But those that didn't know him, it's going to be a judgment by works. It says this over and over and over again. Even Paul says it. It says this right from Matthew to Revelation, from from uh, Jubilees to Shepherd of Hermas. The judgment is by works. And Yahshua himself here says that my judgment is righteous in verse 30. Those that have done good will come unto the resurrection of life. They'll have a station in life. Those that have done evil will be judged. What their sentences are, are up to them. Maybe rehabilitation, maybe re-education, maybe the fire pit. I don't know. But his judgment is a righteous judgment. Why? Because he seeks not his own will, but the will of the one who sent him. We think we're in the gospel age now, but we're not. The gospel age is coming up. This has not been the gospel age. These last two days have been the age of tribulation. If it was the gospel age, the good news would be to every country. But pretty soon, in the seventh day, when all lawlessness will cease, and all will be resurrected from the dead, and all the nations will be judged and set aside as sheep and goats, that is going to give us an incredible opportunity to minister, especially if we're among the elect, and we're resurrected in that first resurrected as spirit and body both, and are able to traverse up and down to the new Jerusalem hovering in the sky, we'll be sent out on so many missions, and we will accomplish those missions, because we will not have to deal with the devil. We will no longer have an adversary. Now let's go to Israel in the last five minutes. Israel is proclaimed in Joshua chapter 1, verses 2 and 4. Israel isn't just to be that little patch of land on the Mediterranean. Yahweh says to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, unto the land that I give to them, even to the children of Israel, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your border. 
And if you've got the syllabus out there, you're going to see a little map of the promised land. It goes from the Euphrates River clear over to the Nile River in Egypt. And it goes from the Mediterranean Sea down to the Persian Gulf. And it encloses Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Arabia, Israel, Lebanon, and part of Egypt. That is the promised land, not the little strip there. Second, Barnabas says that he changes the bodies in space to sun, moon, and stars. Now, what this is is a way of saying that he changes the calendar back to the calendar of the Davidic kingdom. After all, he's going to be King David again. Who was King David's high priest? Zadok. And wasn't it also Ezekiel the prophet says that Zadok and the sons of Zadok would be high priests for eternity? And if there's a Davidic kingdom set up and Yahshua is to be both king and priest, would he not be a Zadokic priest? And would he not keep the Davidic calendar? And did he not keep that in his time? Of course he did. He was a scion of David. What other way of keeping time would he choose? But the way prophesied in Ezekiel 40, 46, the keepers of the charge of the altar, these are the sons of Zadok, which from among the sons of Levi come near to Yahweh to minister to him. The ancient priestly calendar will be restored in this day, on this seventh day. Since it was lifted up and casted out in 162 BC by the Maccabees on account of their desire to line up with the Greeks, the Maccabees accepted a Greek pagan calendar and got rid of the priestly calendar. That Josephus said that Israel used for 1,000 years. Yet this calendar is still preserved in the Dead Sea Scrolls and is based on the observations of Enoch. It's a solar, not a lunar calendar, and more and more are following it in anticipation of the millennium. I want you to consider again Matthew 24, 6 through 8. How is the seventh day supposed to commence? Don't forget that map you just saw. Don't forget the countries that I just mentioned. In order for the kingdom to be fully what Yahweh said it's going to be, those nations have to be in uproar. The prophets say that those nations will do themselves off through civil war, that they will cannibalize each other, that they will turn on each other and kill each other. So what does Joshua say happens at the beginning of this day? He says, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see that you're not troubled, for these things need to come to pass, but the end of evil is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, as ethnoi against ethnoi in the Greek, which means tribe against tribe, wrong uh, translation is nation, tribe against tribe, and kingdom against kingdom, Basileia is the word for kingdom, it means rulership or political entity and there will be famines and earthquakes in diverse places, but all these things, look, are the beginning of travail. Yahshua was speaking of the destruction of the temple for one in 70 AD, but what we must also assume is that he's talking about the beginning of the seventh day as well what kind of wars are we talking about We're seeing them right now. If you want end time scriptures, don't go to Revelation. It's fulfilled. Go to Isaiah 12 through 19. And you'll see that we're right along in chapter 18 or so and moving toward 19 to the fulfillment of all things. We're talking about in those passages, civil wars within the geographical locations that Yahweh described in Yahshua as the promised land from the Euphrates to the Nile. Civil wars that would decimate a heathen, anti-Messianic population. Now we're seeing those right now in this geographic area. That's why I say, what is Joshua doing today? He's stirring things up. Wars and rumors of wars in order for that which has been prophesied to come to pass and these nations to be pacified and their populations to be either pacified or decimated. Because the end of the story is in Isaiah 19, 22 through 24. This is the end of my story too. Listen to this. And Yahweh shall smite Egypt. Smiting then healing. I taught this message uh, seven years ago or eight, and they said to me, Brother Jack, that can't happen because Egypt will never have a civil war. That was in uh, the um, congregation of, of Yahweh in Pensacola, Florida. Egypt will never have a civil war. Well, we know they just had one. Two, 
and Egypt is in line now. Yahweh shall smite Egypt, smiting, then healing. And they shall return unto Yahweh, and he shall be entreated of them, and shall heal them. In that day shall there be a highway. Listen to this. A highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrians shall come into Egypt, the Egyptians into Assyria, Assyria is Syria and Iraq, and the Egyptians shall worship with the Assyrians. In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth. This is the prophesied land of promise, the millennial kingdom. We're talking about a land that encompasses between Euphrates and the Nile, and it needs to be subdued, and it is. Now, I want to end this up right now by giving you something that's going to blow your mind. If you follow up on this, if you have your pencil, I want you to write down a website address. It's www.abrahampath.org. Here's a prophecy in Isaiah 19 for our time. It's never been fulfilled that there's a highway between these countries where Abraham walked that's going to be safe and a pathway for Assyrians, Israelites, and Egyptians to walk on and pray together. What blows my mind is that this is happening. With the Abraham Path Initiative, they don't even know that they're fulfilling prophecy. The vision was that wouldn't it be great if we could put a walking path that was safe on the same route that Abraham took from Ur of the Chaldees up to Haran to Egypt and down to Beersheba. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all the people in the countries that traverse could walk on this road together, speak together and pray without fear of being molested or fear of terrorism or war? This idea got to Harvard University. Harvard University raised millions of dollars to put it into place. And when I heard about it a couple years ago on a radio broadcast, I thought immediately of Isaiah 19. And I thought, my, how this prophecy is being fulfilled and by people who don't even know it. And besides that, how many people that are believers even know about this road as a sign of the peaceful kingdom? Please look it up. Consider the end of Isaiah 19. Consider what I've said. And then feel good about what's happening in this world. Because it's happening for our benefit. For the benefit of the elect and the mixed multitude and those on the Torah path. And certainly, I hope, when you read about the Abraham path and the vision that went with it, you'll see how marvelously Yahweh is fulfilling a most impossible prophecy right in our own day, in our own time, in a secret way in which nobody knows about, but now you and me. Check it out. My friend, always anticipate the best, not the worst. Look forward to the day that is the new day. Enjoy every day of this time of healing of the earth and pay no attention to those troubling things that are going on in certain places in the world because this is the plan of Yahweh. We are in his kingdom. He has everything in his hands right now. You know what he's doing.